It's an honor to be assisting your Congress today. Um, good morning to everyone that's in attendance. My name is Dev Kumar Palmer. I'm an international sports lawyer and senior professor um, in sports law as well. Uh, I'm based in London. I spearhead my own practice, uh, which is named Palmer's. Uh, our head office is actually in Madrid, in Spain, uh, but I'm I'm still based in, in London, which is where I'm born and raised. So 90% of our work is in football. Um, we engage in both non-contentious work, uh, i.e. you know, drafting negotiation contracts, um, transfer agreements, uh, nationally and internationally, as well as contentious work, which would usually mean that we have to litigate at FIFA or CAS um, or deal with matters at the IOC or various other international federations. Uh, so that's me in a nutshell. I've been a professor in sports law for about eight or nine years, if I'm not mistaken, and I've been lecturing in general for about 15 uh, years. So uh, that's that's wow. that's me, Beverly. Awesome. Oh, well, I know I know that's you, but <laughs> for the benefit of the audience, you can hear how pretty awesome his um, profile is. He does a lot. Dev, you do a lot, actually. Um, I think the purpose of this session is really to maybe expose the audience to what um, opportunities there are in sports disputes. I think one thing we're still lagging behind here in Nigeria, I wouldn't say Africa because I don't want to, it's not, I'm, I don't have the rights to speak on behalf of Africa, but at least in Nigeria, we tend to, our, our dispute mechanisms are kind of faulty. We, we're supposed to have, you know, active um, dispute uh, bodies within sports associations you know so when you have an, an issue typically you should go within your association to start with before even thinking about going out a lot of the time that doesn't happen and this cuts across football basketball tennis or most of the sports sure. so people really feel stuck you know there's a couple of sports lawyers i'm sure in the audience as well and they know the frustration they felt just trying to handle you know just trying to get their issues resolved so what we're, we're saying how can we move forward even from a private perspective i know mediation is now big um arbitration is obviously there and congratulations we, to you as well beverly for just being appointed as a mediator at thank FIFA. you thank you so much thank you thank you so really i think this this session is i mean whilst we're waiting for professor hiribe who's also at cas like yourself what what can individuals do what can sports professionals whether the bodies themselves or lawyers or athletes players what can they do to to, to feel like they have more control over their disputes because sometimes it's like something goes wrong and they feel like they're at the mercy of the body that they that they belong to, you know, whatever that body is. So, what in your what would you advise? I suppose. Um, I think um, just just to clarify, because I think you mentioned uh, you mentioned Professor Hiribe is at CAS like myself. Uh, Professor Hiribe um, is an arbitrator. An uh, arbitrator. We litigate. Yeah, we litigate at oh, CAS. So I'm you not... litigate at CAS. Sorry. Yeah. The professor yeah. is an actual CAS arbitrator. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Thank so um, we. Um, we, we litigate at CAS. I'm not an arbitrator yet. Uh, who knows what happens in the in the future? But um, we we um, appear on behalf of you know different parties um, at CAS quite quite frequently, and uh, and I enjoy doing that at the moment. So that's the way I think it will stay for a few years at least. But in terms of your your question, um, the first thing, and, and I know you've heard me say this before, Beverly. So apologies for boring you, but for the audience that may not have had the the misfortune of listening to me before the first thing is <laughs> is education that's, that's number it. one education. and it doesn't have to it doesn't have to be formalized i mean i know that um you know i have an involvement in in a leading master's course in sports law and whatever right but education is merely understanding uh, learning about and understanding what your surroundings are right now ultimately if participants within sports whether they're on the field of play or in the uh you know in the ring or in the court or whatever it might be if participants in the sport fully understand their surroundings they understand the framework of the, the sport the governance and what mechanisms are actually applicable then 
I would suggest, and I think you and Professor might agree, that we'll knock out 50% of the issues that, that arise because people will be able to appreciate where they can go if they need to dispute uh, something or if they need to resolve a, a situation. Of course, thereafter, you also mentioned that sometimes nationally and internationally, a dispute resolution mechanism could be faulty. Um, and this is, you know, not only confined to Nigeria, we see it everywhere. We see it in England, we see it in the States, we see it everywhere. Sometimes you might find yourself in a process that is faulty. And then we've got to follow a different, a different pathway, be it a litigious one or be it a political one or whatever else it might be. But the vast majority of issues that people tend to face from sports tend to be fairly, let's say, regular kinds of issues, disciplinary breaches, um, financial misfeasance, whatever else it might be. And most of this stuff can be uh, eradicated if people understand um, what to do and what not to do. And then if they still carry on doing it, then um, frankly, there are mechanisms in place in, 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 many, in many jurisdictions to be able to deal with these kinds of uh, breaches. But that would be you know, the minority I'm not suggesting for a moment that most people want to constantly dope or, or, or steal money or, or miss payments to athletes or whatever mm -hmm. else it might be. So first thing for me is always education. That, that provides the basis of, of everything we do, specifically in sports law in this current day and age. Awesome. I mean, education, that's one major message that's coming through all the sessions so far. We need to get more educated. The industry needs to collaborate more, get educated, so we can, so we know our rights, so we know where our, so where we're lacking, etc. I, I want to welcome Professor Hiri Bay on. Um, thank you so much. Professor is like my mentor, can I just say? And this is what, and and even and Dev too. He he doesn't know it. He's like my reluctant mentor. <laughs> <laughs> but Prof is my proper, like he said, yes, you're my mentee. So um, welcome, Prof. It's so good to have you here. Um, do you want to just introduce yourself to the audience? Mm. Um, as always, uh, Bobby, thank you very much for inviting me uh, to participate in this, um, should I say, well-intentioned uh, um, events. Um, I'm sorry I, I, I came in late, and that was because I was trying to navigate my way around the high tech technology which you employed <laughs> uh, to host this event. So I was battling my way to Zoom and uh, what's this Hey Summit? And hey was, Summit. Yeah. So yeah. forgive me for coming in late. Um, and again, please always remember when you're hosting these events that some of us we are born well, well before computers. And it will take a while for us to get, you know, very conversant with uh, all the technology, technology that is now available. But that's a good place to start. And I must commend you and your, the innovation you brought to bear in hosting these events. Now, you've asked me to um, introduce myself. Uh, and I thank you for the opportunity. Uh, what I will say that is relevant to our purposes is that um, I'm, I'm a full-time international arbitrator and dispute resolver. Um, based in London, and um, my experience as it pertains to CAS or, or sporting events is that I have been involved in quite some time in the resolution of football-related disputes. My The trajectory through which I got into CAS was through resolving football league disputes in England. As an arbitrator, not as a litigator who as a dev is. I'm a full-time arbitrator and dispute resolver. And I want to make that distinction clear for our audience. What I do for everyone, if the opportunity arises, is I undertake to resolve disputes, either on the international level or the regional level or the local level, either as arbitrator, mediator, expert determiner, adjudicator or early neutral evaluator. I don't do counsel. I don't act as counsel in those specialisms. So, and, and the umbrella word for all of those specialisms is acting as a neutral. So, and I say this uh, because of um, the, uh, the, the relevance of what I'm saying uh, impacts on the topic for discussion, which is why it is, I, I take my time to break down what I do 
so that the stakeholders understand what opportunities are out there to resolve disputes in a cost and time efficient manner such that preserves the business relation relationships that exist either between sporting bodies and sponsors or sportsmen and women and sporting organizations or national bodies and stakeholders in various countries. We're talking about Africa here. So um, I don't know if I've gone off on a tangent. And to complete my introduction, I'm also... <laughs> no, no, <laughs> you're not. You're clarifying and setting the foundation. Thank you very much. But um, when I'm given the opportunity, I think I tend to talk a lot uh, and you understand why. Now, um, I'm also a barrister. I was called to the Nigerian bar some time ago. Well, as far back as 1982. I don't know where, where you, some of you were at that time. And I'm also called to the English bar um, of Lincoln's in here in England. And uh, for my sins, I also teach in a number of universities, both in Europe, the UK, and recently in Africa. And what do I teach? They are pre predominantly subjects that pertain to dispute resolution, because that's my passion, how to resolve disputes out of the courts. In a, remember, in a cost, time, efficient manner that continues to preserve the business relationship that exists between parties. So that is my, um, that, that would be the end of my introduction. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Brilliant. Okay, so that, I mean, we all know why we're here, dispute resolution in sports. And we all, okay, I don't want to make too many assumptions, but I think we might all agree that dispute resolution in sports in Nigeria specifically is not where it should be. Reason being, and I have made allusion to some of the to some of the reasons why um, there's no setup of dispute resolution chambers. There's no proper uh, dispute resolution process. So when these grievances occur, the athletes, the footballers, the players, they don't know what to do. They end up going to courts, which kind of is counterproductive. So now for the purpose of educating, because Dev mentioned quite, uh, he expressed that there's such an, an important need to educate. How can we turn things around little by little? What would be the first step? So if someone was to say, oh, I, I have an issue with, um, with my sports organization, um, how would we educate that person? Because we really want to just change the tide. We want people to think less of litigation, court, 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 although that still has its own place, but other alternatives that could work in lieu of the courts, for instance or alternatives that work outside the organization. So if an organization doesn't even have an internal dispute mechanism, what would they do? What would, you know, someone like uh, the player in the previous panel, maybe he had a grievance, he wasn't paid. What would, what would he do? What would you recommend he does, Dev? Oh, I think <clears throat> there's several questions in there, Beverly. So <laughs> I'll, I'll, <laughs> I thought I thought so too. <laughs> I think um, I'll I'll try and go in 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 turn on on each of them, and of course, Professor, wherever you you see fit to intervene, please you're invited to do so. But I think with regards to education, as I mentioned previously, it doesn't necessarily have to be a formal education. It's wonderful that now, uh, particularly for example, in our institution, we're starting to see more participants from Africa joining. And this is something that I've been trying to push for for the last eight or nine years. And I'm, I'm glad to see that there is an increase. It's wonderful. Uh, we had our first Rwandi's student a couple of years ago, and we've had a couple more since and, and so on. However, we don't necessarily need our, our young people to, to go off to, to England or to Spain or to Switzerland to do a master's and come back. It doesn't have to be as formalized. It is simply just reading and understanding, or, or if not necessarily reading, if there might be a challenge with, with that uh, skill, for example, the ability to, to speak to and appreciate what the surroundings are. And I, I reiterate that this can only be, th this can be the only basis for how things will change. Because if we look at it from a slightly governance uh, perspective, which I know Beverly is your area, right? I'll use a governance term 
structures and cultures yeah we can change the structure in five minutes if you give me a set of regulations i can tweak and track changes whatever i need to in a very short space of time but changing the culture of an organization or of a, of an institution or a nation usually takes a generation right it takes a long period of time for these things to happen so i wouldn't want for anyone to think that right all of a sudden overnight changes are going to be um, deployed in Nigeria, in Cameroon, in, in Algeria, wherever else we're talking about on the continent. Uh, but ultimately, we need to have more discussions and more engagement. So if we narrow it down in a very simple way, one of the best starting points is exactly what, what you guys at OAL are doing right now. Having this kind of conversation, opening it up and inviting people to be you know, active or passive participants so that they're getting exposed to something that they may not have been aware of in the first place. So I think that's the first thing to, to look at. If we go to the more specific question, and I hope I haven't missed anything in between, but the more specific question of an athlete having an issue and, and where they might be able to go if, if they don't have the, um, if they don't have, uh, you know, the appropriate mechanism internally within the football federation within the athletics federation whatever else it might be well the reality is that if you don't have these internal mechanisms at at uh, institutional level then you are at ground zero and you have to resort to the to the national um the national court system wherever you might be right now of course professor might also wish to chime in um, when we talk about alternative dispute resolution mechanisms there are many other things that can be done. However, the challenge with sometimes arbitration or mediation, as, as you guys will know full well, is where the decision has been rendered and what institution has been following this process, because these are ultimately private ways of resolving disputes. So if the decision rendered doesn't have jaws, if it doesn't have enforceability, then it doesn't really make a difference if, if someone has... Uh, receive the decision from such arbitrator, such mediator. So yes, when we're at ground zero, we have to resort to the national courts. It's not ideal, but hey, we all we all had to start somewhere. And, and hopefully uh, those jurisdictions that do not have the appropriate mechanisms or they've got faulty mechanisms um, will over time find themselves in a far stronger situation in, you know, God willing, five, 10, 15 years time it's, it's not a it's not a quick win it's a long-term process but we've got to start today mm, very true very true it's about starting recognizing the faults and a bit of will there has to be a willingness to absolutely do this right and perhaps even lobbying maybe those of us who are on the dispute resolution end can say oh it might it, would you consider putting this in because maybe they may it might be ignorant sometimes and they just need a, ha a bit of hand holding so you know the dispute resolution professionals can come together and say oh sport your your institute of such and such why don't you we can help put in place you know pro bono or whatever this um structure because ultimately it's going to benefit all of us at the end of the day. Once the structure is in place, then people can now bring their disputes. They can now seek uh, counsel to represent them and such. Okay, so that, that's valid. Um, professor, I want to ask you. Yes, um, madam. <laughs> the, the representation of, okay. The question I want to ask is, when it comes to um, disputes, at the CAS coming this end, coming from Nigeria, coming from Africa, would you say that it's disproportionately low or high or what kind of trend have you seen? Because that might give us clues as to the amount of work that we're not doing here or that we need to maybe pick up on. So just wanted to ask you. Well, I'm, hold that question in one hand. All right. <laughs> And, uh, and remind me to address it, but I want to um, either um, uh, engage in the questions which um, Dev answered and okay. either, uh, if you like, contribute my own widow's might to that discourse, 
and uh, broaden it out a bit. From where I'm standing, uh, because the questions you asked are quite wide ranging and uh, uh, germane to uh, progressing this discussion forward in the right direction. Yeah. Uh, for, where, for where I'm standing, it, it requires a, a, a complete, um, if you like, multi-headed approach to uh, sensitize stakeholders as to what needs to be done uh, to minimize, as it were, uh, disputes that arise in the area and find, um, if you like, less fractious ways of resolving those disputes. And the, the reasons are this. Sports as an endeavor thrives on reputation, honesty, and passion for the ability to excel in different areas of sport. And you don't want that area of endeavor, especially for young men and women, to be solid by if like the shenanigans of people who do not understand what ethics is all about. For that reason, amongst others, it is paramount that um, apart from the courts that are there, these other areas of dispute resolution are uh, examined. And you are right to point out that it may well be ignorance is the reason why this has, is not being taken on to a larger scale, or resistance to change as could be another reason. Now, let me, let me give a few examples to your, drive from the point I'm trying to make. Uh, if you, a few months back or years back, there was a scandal about um, female basketballers in Nigeria whose stipends for some reason or the other had not been paid. And it took those young girls to, you know, to threaten to boycott the next engagement until it was finally sorted out. That was splattered all over the press. I don't know about it. if it was, if I saw it in the local press, only God knows how much it was spat out on social media. I'm not on social media. So if it got to the press in the way Abana that it came all out, I, and that has reputational damage for that sporting organization, however you choose to slice it. That's the female basketball. I mean, imagine young girls, ladies, pulling their weight in basketball. And years back, that had been a, 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 a current commentary with Nigerian footballers who, for some reason or the other, their stipends will get missing. I don't know how, or get stuck up somewhere. And the young boys will try to, well, if you don't pay us, we're not going to do anything. And I, I remember also another incident where some of the players were promised houses after they won uh, something, I think it was the African Nations Cup. It took about 20 or 24 years for those houses to be given to those some old men who did their best to you know, represent their country. And that's from the Nigerian perspective. But these are things, ladies and gentlemen, that ought not to come out in the press. If there was a forum, a private forum for those issues to be resolved, I would not have known about it. I won't be talking about it today. But can you imagine the reputational damage that brings to bear on the sporting organizations concerned. If I'm a donor, for instance, I'll be thinking twice about the next time those sporting organizations come to me for asking for money to sponsor anything. So I've gone down to those set of facts just to show how there is a need and a desire for alternative means of resolving disputes outside of public arena. And the only way to do this, as I say, is to all hands on deck, whether it's through the universities. I don't care whether universities are foreign or in Nigeria or in Africa, whether it's in Rwanda or in Ghana or in Nigeria, there should be a concerted effort from people like you, Beverly, who have initiated these um, uh, discussions through OAL. Talk to the universities, tweak the uh, university LLB or the LLM curriculum to include discussions on sports or models on sports. That's one aspect. Then another the other aspect is the legal profession. Those lawyers like yourselves who have a passion for sports, and I can see a lot of them uh, who are turning up for this event, which is commendable, 
those lawyers who have a passion for sports and what sports represents. I'm sure Beverly, you heard me talk about what I did about sports in, I think it was in Nairobi when I was growing up. Yeah. So it's a passion for sports that brought me here, even though no one knows my name yeah, as regards any particular sport. But I, have a, I had a passion for sports. And I commend those of you lawyers back in Nigeria and other countries in Africa to take the bull by the horn and project and ensure that there's the necessary buy-in to protect the sporting industry by putting these, uh, what do you call it, um, mechanisms in place. So the, law, the, the, the legal fraternity is one, either as, uh, if you like, call it a sport lawyers association or whatever. And I don't care whether it's just basketball alone or whether it's football, you might even fragment into others. I don't care, provided that, you know, that movement is taking place. Then the universities, then even if some of those well-heeled Africans choose to come to London or the US to do sports uh, master's degree, so be it, because they'll, they'll all come back with knowledge and expertise and to ensure that international best practices are deployed you know, to, uh, to effectively manage the sports space. So that's what I say in that regard. Then of course, each sporting association, whether it's the Nigerian Shooting Association, and I'm going to shoot in as obscure as it is, or basketball, or football, or swimming, each organization should have its own dispute resolution mechanism inbuilt. Exactly. And which brings me to a point that Dev made about enforceability. Now, yes, you make a point about um, how effective is arbitration, um, if nobody, if nobody reckons with in the institution that um, administers the uh, what do you call it, the the arbitration itself or the dispute resolution mechanism. Now, the way those things work is different. Once the parties have bought into or who are, they've agreed to arbitrate, they are bound by that award. That award is enforceable in any part of the world, provided those countries are signatories to the New York Convention. And there's another way of getting it done. If if in the sporting association, the code of conduct of each sporting association should ensure that if any of these disputes arise, that the first spot of call for resolution is the dispute resolution mechanism provided by that sporting organization. Yes. So if the sportsman or sportswoman or sporting organization does not, if you like, uh, abide by that, that person is automatically expelled. Mm. So that's how you buy in the, the cooperation of every sportsman or woman or organization into this, uh, the code of conduct or ethics of that mm. particular sports organization. Mm. So who would want to be, go out on a limb if yeah. you know, that organization is there to protect them, protect their interests, both nationally and internationally? So, and before I go to CAS again, there's not, not, nothing stopping each country in Africa from having their own sports resolution uh, um, authority. After all, in the UK, like, as you are aware, the UK has its sporting resolutions. Yes. Most, most, of, most sporting endeavors are resolved there, not necessarily CAS. Yes. They've got sport, um, in Kenya, as you are aware, sport, Kenya has its own sporting uh, um, resolution organization. Yes. There's, there's also one in um, Qatar. Yes. So these are these are efforts at the local level. Each country can start, and it's not just at the local level. Each sporting specialism can have its own organization and inbuilt dispute resolution mechanism. Yeah. So that's what I say, and I hope I've I'm, 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 I've I've loaded what I wanted to say in support of creating the necessary awareness. And if I may round up, these discussions must continue. And yeah. definitely, you must not tire. <laughs> <laughs> Either you or OAL, or what OAL is about, must not tire because you're going to get resistance. You're mm -hmm. going to get pushback. But you must continue with mm -hmm. all the fervor you can muster to continue having these discussions mm -hmm. and broadening the discussion base then it will eventually sink in. After all, I can tell you now that after uh, to and froing, the Nigerian government, I, I read last night, the Senate, 
have eventually approved the amendment, if you like, of, of the, the arbitration. arbitration Act. Do you know how long that took? It took so long, so I, I, long. I say, I say no more, but we got there eventually. <laughs> no, we were all quite happy in the uh, mediation um, community. Good. That's so, how so, I found out. Good. So know. that's why I say these discussions must continue taking place. Yes. You must, yeah. never, you must not tire. You must not give up. What is a relentless pursuit yes. of the, uh, for the El Dorado, as I, I describe it. Now, yeah. let down, let, if I may now go, so I'd not um, overstay my welcome. Let me now go to the caste question. Now, what I've seen is a good number of cases coming through Africa to caste. But there's a problem. The problem for most of those cases is either a lack of will to pursue the case to its logical conclusion, either because of lack of resources, yes, or lack of interest, or lack of know-how. So what you now find is that African party, eventually a case has initiated, initiated in cars, for what, whatever reason, they drop out. You and I know why that can be the case. Yes. Primarily, cost issues. Yes. So that's on the, that on the one hand. Now, on the other hand is the necessity to have a corpus or of well-informed sports lawyers who can represent these parties from Africa. Now, most of them sometimes can't afford to engage lawyers in Switzerland. Mm -hmm. All so, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, uh, <laughs> because, because of the amount of money people like mm -hmm. Dev charge. <laughs> That's another issue. And I remember there was an, another case where they had to do with, um, uh, before I reveal confidentiality now, a Nigerian footballer, but who engaged lawyers, I think they were Belgian, and who were not hmm, quite, should I say, uh, who do not understand the Nigerian culture, let me put it that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so those are the difficulties and challenges. But my, my, spin, my, my spin or my pitch isn't replicate cars in Africa. No, what I say is get our stuff from the ground roots level upwards, well sensitized as to how to deal with this dispute. Build up your own indigenous, our own indigenous homegrown institutions. And then where the appeal lies to cast, then it goes to cast. Mm. That's what I will say. And then because by so doing, you now have a body of lawyers, local, who can go to cast and represent African or Asian parties effectively. I don't know if I've got, I don't know if you get the point. No, you're making a lot of sense. Yeah, you're so, making... so you, you, they, they will have a body of lawyers who have who are au fait, who are experienced with um, uh, sporting issues, whether it has to do with eligibility, whether it has to do with funding, whether it has to do with contracts, about employment, all of that. And they're able to fly all over the world to represent African sportsmen and women, even during the Olympics. That's what I will say in support of um, uh, uh, this discussion. And I don't know if I, um, I have more time, but I think I should um, keep quiet for now and see what other distinguished speakers have to say. We've just got um, our son, um, Chief Chijuke Okoli San, just joined us. So while we're trying to set him up, I'm just okay. going to pass the mic back to Dev. Just to, I guess, what would you say to encourage? Because again, sensitization is a major um, theme coming out of this session. What would you say to? to people in Nigeria now or wherever it is they're tuning in from who have an interest in dispute resolution, how to get stuck in, how to, how to get started. You know, there's going to be some pushback as professor has rightly said, you know, what kind of Sorry. things should they uh, look out for? Awesome. I think, um, <clears throat> first, if I may, Beverly, I'm just going to latch on to what professor was saying very briefly. And I, I completely agree. Um, when we talk about the CAS and we talk about CAS in Africa, what we've always got to understand is that CAS 
essentially is a service provider, right? And it carries the brand of, of CAS, the Court of Arbitration for Sport. Now, do we necessarily need CAS itself as, as the brand um, to be operating in Africa? Or do we need an effective dispute resolution mechanism that's set up uh, in the, the national jurisdictions or pan Africa. I think this is the first point of it. And I, I fall onto the, um, the latter side of the defense, so to speak, where I'm quite vocal. Uh, and I know Beverly, you've, you've heard me say it before and professor, you would have heard me say it even when we were back in Nairobi, I think, yes, uh, yeah. three years ago, we were together in Nairobi. True, 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 yeah. true, um, true. I've said it openly, first of all, uh, we need to have contextually sensitive counsel who understand what's going on. And in order to do that, uh, we need people that are educated. And again, it doesn't need to be formally, but people that are educated to understand the culture of the jurisdiction. Um, B, we need to stop, uh, in, my, in my humble view, just talking about Africa as a whole. We're talking about 50 odd countries and completely different cultures, uh, languages, ways of being. Um, and what we do tend to see, certainly from my experience, Professor, you might might agree or disagree, the vast majority of matters that do come into CAS from Africa tend to be north of the Sahara in any case, mm -hmm. rather than sub-Saharan. So we also have a bit of a disparity there when it comes through. We have a lot of dropout from cases that come through from sub-Sahara, but most of them that actually go into CAS and go right through to their fruition sure. tend to always be North African, um, which, you know, ultimately is now we're talking about another, another culture, another socioeconomic reality, another language as well in, in, in many instances, because many of them are dealt with in French as opposed to, to, to English. So there are so many different considerations to, to, to look into. And I, I would firmly fall in line of developing something over time that is appropriate for the reality in Nigeria, in DRC, in Botswana, in Kenya, you know, we, where, you know, I, we do a lot of work in East Africa. So looking at the, the reality of, of, of these jurisdictions, and then as Professor mentioned, potentially, if necessary, uh, having a, a further appeal route to, to, to CAS. But if the if the institution is well recognized and if it's something that can be given the appropriate accreditation under the New York Convention of 58, which would give it enforceability in 160 odd countries, if I'm not mistaken, then you don't even need to go to CAS because you've mm. effectively got the same enforceability mechanisms as, as you would have had there anyway, and it becomes more cost effective and, and appropriate. So I think when we're talking about dispute resolution mechanisms in sports, uh, in Africa, it's always important to differentiate as to whether we actually want CAS to, to pop along and say, right, we're going to have a centralized office in, in Lagos or in Kigali or wherever it is, we'll run everything our way, or whether we as, as African people or, or African diaspora want to yes. come together and try and put, put something that makes more sense. So I think that's the first thing. And then the second thing, which I would think if I, if I, uh, if I put it together appropriately, flows from that part which is how do people get involved in this yes well if you want to get involved in uh if you simply want to get involved in working uh with legal counsel that go to CAS on on a daily weekly monthly basis then invariably it's just like with any other sector do your shadowing your deviling make make connections as much as you can be exposed to virtual or in-person sessions like the one that you and your firm have put on beverly um and and try and try and persevere to break through the door these are easy things you know i'm not giving you anything special a hundred other lawyers would have said the same sort of thing before but what i would also advise is look at what's not being done and that is where the opportunity can arise particularly when we talk about the continent of africa or we look at, in, in the wider sense, the continent of Asia. In South America, sports law is, is quite well developed already. Mm. Okay, um, But we look at Africa, we look at uh, Asia, particularly Eastern Asia, as opposed to West Asia, which is now you know, the Middle Eastern region. Um, uh, sports law is not as well developed. And, and where, there is, where there is a chasm, there is opportunity. Yes. Now, again, it doesn't mean that there's going to be a quick win 
that someone's going to pop along and say, right, you don't have sports law here. I'm going to become a millionaire. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> if it did, then we'd all be in a different situation. Absolutely. But, um, Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> however, um, this is where there is a, a real opportunity for people that seek to enter the sports law sector to assess the reality, to determine what changes can be made, and then to, to speak about it, to raise these issues and to, to potentially get themselves involved in, in engendering that change. Uh, so again, it's not, it's not the easy route, it's not a quick route, but that's certainly what I would, I would suggest to people. Look where, look where there is an opening and, and that's where you can find your opportunity rather than being one of a thousand people that send me or many other law firms C, CVs every week. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> Where there is a chasm, there is opportunity. I want to use this opportunity now to bring in um, Chief Chijoke Okoli-san. He's actually in Abuja. I think he was at a valedictorian service. You can, you can unmute yourself, sir. Thank you for joining. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Bavli. Um, I probably need a cloning service so that I'll be at the validity session in Supreme Court for Justice or Delay and at the same time participate in this very well important uh, seminar. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. As you can see, I just had to take off some of our funny ceremonial gear. Right, <laughs> to participate Welcome. On Welcome. Uh, yes. At least it's a, it's like a nice to... depiction of the of the profession, so to speak. But I mean, without I know you're very busy at the moment. But as a practicing sports lawyer and you know a son at that as well in Nigeria, did you just want to give us some, you know, for the benefit of the audience, some um, insight as to some of the disputes encountered and what should be the trend going forward uh, yesterday uh, we heard the great news that um, the arbitration conciliation act has now been amended to include mediation and for people like me who are neither arbitrators or litigators i'm a mere mediator i was so excited because this is now another avenue potentially that people can pursue for, for football disputes but as a court litigator yourself you know what kind of experiences have you had and what advice do you give to the sports community because they still seem quite confused about you know what what uh, course of action to pursue because the dispute resolution mechanisms here are faulty that is the dedicated sports mechanisms are faulty so what should the legal community do maybe to make things okay um let me let me tell you something first and foremost even though it's a part of group self-indictment avoid the Nigerian court as much as possible. It would have spent all my life litigating. But um, like in um, uh, the English uh, classic, you know, uh, novel, you said, don't any honest practitioner will tell you just uh, not so much to suffer every wrong that may be done to you. But you see, here yeah, we have a case that will last for 10, 15 years. So it becomes so, 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 so important for you to, uh, for those of us in the imagined area of uh, sports as a business or as an industry to embrace an alternative dispute resolution mechanism that would bring to bear the necessary speed and dispatch required. So you don't have, we don't want to have a, you know, uh, uh, a case by the time it finishes, it becomes academic. So um, I've uh, had the privilege of working, as you may well know, leading certain groups when the Nigerian Economic Summit group intervened decisively on this matter. We have our own recommendations. This is actually not even the first because uh, uh, um, Chief Aduki and Messi Ameka, the, the Nigerian Football International, who's also a very senior lawyer, had headed up um, a committee, presented a report 
to the Ministry of Sports and Youth Development about the crying necessity for a sports specific arbitration panel to serve the needs of Nigerians. You know, it, it, it cannot be overemphasized. You have quite a lot of people in the sports community who have disputes, but for starters, how many people know about cars? Even for those who know about cars, the airspace is prohibited. So you have a situation where a lot of people with genuine grievances that you know that have merit, but because of the absence of a viable uh, uh, you know, dispute resolution mechanism, they suffer in silence or just uh, go away. So what we're planning to do, or what I think is important, and here this your seminar, uh, this seminar by OAL is particularly important in keeping the issue in the, on the front banner, that let us go back and dust up a lot of the reports. I can tell you, yes, we updated the one done by uh, 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 Chief Amasi Mecca, but it's all in compre you know, comprehensive. And in fact, part of our recommendation is that to avoid the government route. You know, I mean, um, the truth of the matter is that a lot of times, and which has impeded uh, sports development in Nigeria, that a lot of times, instead of government being an enabler or a facilitator, on which it becomes an impediment to best practices. So what we actually had uh, provided to bypass the uh, Arbitration Act as it were, um, have a private sector driven entity as happens in most other countries, uh, have, uh, have the entity set up as a company limited by guarantee or, you know, of that, uh, you know, but regulated by karma. But the key thing is to, as, as much as we have all the uh, stakeholders, the sporting federations and everybody on board. Well, good to know. You don't need to reinvent the uh, the wheel. The things are there. The Kenyans have their own. But if we have what in Nigeria, it's long overdue because it would not only serve the sporting community in Nigeria, it would serve the smaller West African sub-regions that they can come. It's closer to them rather than going to Switzerland and then who has the, uh, and the money. You know, I mean, we come from the 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 the, the, the poor right or the poorest section of the world. So um, these things have to be done in such a way to take into uh, consideration our peculiarities, including uh, the uh, the leanness of our pockets. But it doesn't mean that if we don't have um, deep pockets like the Europeans, then um, we don't have uh, grouses which we need to ventilate. So that's my uh, position that we work more from the point of view of advocacy group. The work, the groundwork has been done. We've done the report, it is there. The most important thing is to um, maybe uh, celebrate the advocacy so that um, um, we would uh, just implement what has been there gathering dust as you as you do know yeah. as it were uh, valid no really um so, valid point a lot of the work has been done sam that's what you're suggesting the work has been done why not a private initiative you don't necessarily have to wait for the government to set up i think uh, professor alluded to the fact that sports resolutions in the UK is not a government body, it's a private body, but they've garnered enough respect that the yeah. sporting community now sees them as the apex centre for sports dispute resolution in England. So like you said, um, Sam, um, it, it's, it's really up to the community now, perhaps the, the legal, sporting legal community to make a stand and come together as it were, and maybe set something up. And, and to the point on mediation, someone actually asked a question in the Q&A, 
that could the lack of a viable mediation program in our sporting organizations be as a result of little or no legislation made in that regard? But I think we'll all agree that just yesterday, that question is now, I would say, overruled because mediation is now formally recognized by the amendment that has been passed yesterday. So now the question is, how do we sensitize mediation as one of the um, formal uh, ADR routes for, for sporting uh, organizations, stakeholders, etc., to to follow. Um, I don't know who I could pose this question. I mean, I'm throwing this open now to the floor. We've, we've heard from three very erudite um, um, sports legal professionals and generally, you're all saying the same thing. More awareness is needed. The legal community actually needs to maybe galvanize. I think there might be too much waiting around, waiting to see what happens. Um, forums such as this are good, but we need more. cannot do it all. <laughs> so we need more of these forums to get the conversation going. Um, I think I, I want to invite more questions from the floor. But I mean, in the absence of more questions, I will just ask each and every one of you to please give your closing commentary on on your on your ideas for dispute resolution um, in the in the sporting arena, your vision or your advice or suggestions, whatever it may be. So let me start with Professor Iribe, your closing comments. Well. well uh... Beverly, thank you very much uh, uh, again for uh, uh, um, inviting me to share my thoughts. Now, um, the way I see it um, is this. Um, all of these initiatives are initiatives in the right direction. And uh, I speak here as um, a Nigerian in diaspora, but I watch you know, um, what goes on in Nigeria closely. And it seems to me that what um, Nigeria needs, and perhaps it applies to other African countries to a lesser extent, is for such initiatives to be brought to bear to those who are very close to the, those in the corridors of power. Mm -hmm. uh, you use the expression hand-holding and it's not just hand-holding, it's, it's, it's much more than hand-holding. And you need to find those who are able to see those who are the, if you like, the, uh, I think the expression is the men of timber and caliber in the Nigerian governance space, who are the ears of those who direct, um, what do you call it, um, good governance, either with the Sporting Federation or uh, the the SAN mentioned the ministries. My problem with the ministries is that it, they, they, are, they tend to be um, uh, fraught by what I call sales service procedures. Nothing gets done. The file is there. Yes, we are working on it. <laughs> Keep in view. Keep in that view. same file will be kept in view for the next 10 years. Mm -hmm. And they'll say, we are working on it. But nothing is happening. You need go getters, action people, yes, to support these initiatives. Yes, going by, by what the Leonard essay has said about a, 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 a report spearheaded by no other personality than a doctor messy maker. It's like it's accumulating dust. How can that be? How can that be? But that is the peculiarity of Nigeria, and why I suggest by way of advice, that you need those men and women, perhaps Beverly are one of them, of timber and caliber that can walk into the corridors of power and get them to appreciate that these things we are talking about are of importance. That's what I say in closing remarks. But um, because if you look at it, even the cast we talk about, let's not forget that cast was established by a black man. An African at that. Correct. From Senegal, yes. <laughs> Justice yep, Kemba 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 correct. Yes. So someone spoke to him for him to spearhead that. Yes. So we need to find someone like that. Yes. 
within Af in Nigeria, the Congo, yes. Ghana, who it can, can drop done. right information in the right ears at the right time. Yes, it can be done. Then that's how, because that's how these things work. And in, in, in addition to the efforts, uh, initiatives like yours are uh, uh, carrying out, the one the SAM belongs to, and all other, other discussions, is a continuous work in progress. And that's why I say, do not relent. They're going to get pushed back. And if someone like Amesi Mecca's document is still like gathering dust, that was a number one a winger for the Green Eagles years ago. And a, an erudite lawyer, an attorney general of, uh, before an attorney general of River State. Yet, nothing is being done. So what that tells you is that we have, all of us inclusive, we have a big job on our hands and we must continue to talk the talk and walk the walk. That, that, those will be my uh, closing remarks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Over to you, Dev. What are your closing remarks? <laughs> Can you hear me? Sorry, I was just uh, typing in what I hope is the appropriate spelling for Kepa and Bayer. No, you, um, you, you, you spelled it. There, there's no I. Ah, oh, yeah. I apologize. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> uh, so, um, no, but bang on with what Professor said. Uh, Kepa and Bayer um, was the chair of putting together the CAS statutes in 1983, if I'm not mistaken, and then Got the it. CAS was enacted in on June the 30th, Absolutely. 1984. Absolutely. Uh, so it's important that this is recognized. And, and this is something that, you know, I've had the, let's say the privilege to say every time I've been invited virtually and presentially to a Congress um, in Africa on sports law. And every single time, it raises a, a, a gasp of surprise, which um, which surprises and disappoints me in equal measure. Now, that's not to criticize any of the audience members here today or any of the audience members I've come across before, but to criticize the, the wider situation that this has not been made a bigger deal out of. And we're talking about the, the highest sporting authority in the world and previously, we were talking about the, the lack of engagement or the lack of appropriate uh, engagement through to logical conclu conclusion from African stakeholders at this body, which was, which was put together and, and pushed forward by, by an African person. So in, in that sense, I think I, I circle back to my, my main point and I make, uh, I, I'm not ashamed of repeating it frequently, which is education 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 constant development and relentless desire to understand the the sector and that may manifest itself in doing a master's it may manifest itself in trying to to, to join the chartered institute of arbitrators or i think there was a question also with regards to uh, um, if uh, if there are any mediation courses out there it, it it may do something like that or it may simply be ensuring that the individual and the, the those connected to the individual those connected to the institutions that are connected to the individual are exposing themselves and sensitizing themselves to all of the issues that can actually arise from a sporting context because as it stands what we have is um the the manifestation in 2022 the manifestation of an aggressively commercialized sector, which has disproportionately grown worldwide over the last 50 years. Yeah, not not the last couple of hundred years, the last 50 odd years, everything has changed within sport. But we still have structures and in some instances, individuals or professionals in place that are still operating clubs or franchises or, or football federations or whatever it might be in a manner which was not designed to be able to govern this kind of current reality now again that's not always to criticize the people that are are involved because things have moved along very very quickly but ultimately if we all educate ourselves about the disparity in what the structures are and what the current reality is as well as we continue assisting the education of everyone else around us, 
then we can hope to, to assess, to pinpoint and engender that change that we need to. And again, it's not, it's not a short-term thing. These, these are long-term wins, but everything is based on education, contextual understanding, um, the cultural recognition, the specificity of the, of, of the sport and the discipline itself. So for my closing remark, if you're only going to take one word away from anything I've told you today, that word should be, I hope, education. Awesome. Education. Get educated. Get the skills. People are asking about how to become a mediator. I think I've um, posted um, how to um, get those qualifications or you can you can always send me an email if you like and I can send you details because I think it's becoming more and more important. OK, I think we've just lost um, San. But, um, you know, this has been so insightful. I mean, there's so many questions here. Unfortunately, we have no time because we've got another session coming up. I think, okay, one question I think we could take quickly, that shouldn't take time is, Amel B is asking, do you think Africa has proper representation with respect to the composition at the CAS? That's a bit of a tricky question because what do you mean? Composition at the council level, composition amongst the litigators, composition in terms of the people that appear before the CAS. I think we've already addressed that um, mostly North Africans are seeing their matters through to the end. Sub-Saharan African matters tend to drop out. Um, Professor Hiribe um, mentioned that potentially finance, finances might be one major factor. I even had a conversation where I met my mentor, Professor, and Dev, my other mentor, and um, I, I met the general secretary of um, the CAS. He happened to attend our events, not our event, but uh, the chartered, the chartered um, I think it's the CIRB Kenya. They held a special program on sports arbitration and the general secretary was invited. And I happened to have a very quick conversation with him. And I said to him, why don't we have enough Africans at um, CAS? And he said, well, you need to go back and, 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 and again, get more, get the training more you know more more skills more upskilling and then apply because if people are not applying it may not trickle down even with the fifa mediation opportunity i just applied and i applied based on my experience in nigeria it wasn't from anywhere but nigeria so i think the message today is um let's be more visible let's collaborate uh join more programs as dev has mentioned and professor has also mentioned um let's we must not relent we must keep at it as tiring as it might be but obviously it's very rewarding but once if more, i may I'll, beverly oh please dev go ahead so please. i just wanted to latch on to that uh, very quickly and, and i'll i would respectfully divert a little bit from what matthew said to you and, and matthew and i have discussed this several times before and we always politely butt heads on it if i if i can um, yes, it's one thing getting the, the education and the understanding, but as I also reiterated, the education doesn't necessarily have to be formal. And I think sometimes the discourse that comes from Europe, and I understand and I appreciate that there might be a bit of um, hypocriticism in what I say, because essentially I'm, I'm an Englishman of, of African stock. You know, I'm just a London boy, right? <laughs> um, but sometimes the discourse that arrives from Europe and I'm going to use this, this visualization down to Africa, which is horrible, uh, is you must go back and get the education. We've just spoken about Kepa and Bayo, who set the CAS up. You frankly telling me that we don't have experienced counsel and True. judges and senior members across 54 countries in Africa, that's True. an absolute load of rubbish. Yeah. True. So I think we need to, we need to appreciate the context of what we're dealing with as we would in every sector the same way if i was to do you know we we're very blessed we only do 100 percent sports law in our company i don't do real estate i don't do anything else if i had to go and do a case in that area i would have to understand the context right so as with any lawyer who might be working in a different sector they've got to sensitize themselves to the reality of that sector agreed 100 percent but for anyone to come and say you guys have going got to go and get training and education okay it disrespects the reality in my humble view it disrespects does. the reality 
of the caliber that we do have across the, the continent, one billion people, different legal jurisdictions and, and fantastic people like, um, you know, like, like, like um, the gentleman that was with us who unfortunately has left, like Professor who's with us now, it disrespects that. So I think sure. we've, we've also got to be proud and realistic of what we have, but realistic and humble at the same time about yes. what we need to understand and not let anyone, you know, down, down. Uh, downplay or, or tread upon the qualifications that one has already achieved. I think that's important. That's true. Thanks for that. We need to remember who we are, where we are coming from. And, you know, we are very blessed and intelligent people. And, and sorry to rant, uh, but it's, no, it's something that it's important. it's important to highlight for me. That consciousness is very, it, oh, I know it sounds like black power movement, but it, it's a consciousness that we all mm. need to have that confidence to be able to step out and believe that we can. Yes, we can, in the words of Barack Obama. And on that note, I really need to bring this to an end. Dev Kumar Patel, my friend, thank you so much. Professor Ike Hiribe, thank you so much. You've both been absolutely amazing. I, I want to now invite um, the audience, I hope you've been enjoying the session, to jump in to the next session. We're kind of late, but it's fine. It's it's how things work. So thank you so much once thank again. You, thank you. Yeah, God bless. Thanks. Good Bye. to see you again, Professor. Thank you.